Okay. Okay. And we are live. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Deborah Kempf Shoemaker. I'm happy that you're having me again, Mal. This is fun. I was really looking forward to this. Yes, and me too. Um, we had a wonderful first interview yes. almost two years ago. I know. I know. I looked at my calendar and I'm like, whoa, I can't believe it was that long ago. <laughs> the, the, the Jews say, oy vey. It's been too okay. long. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, here we are again. And mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know me, I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I am hosting this wonderful children's literature channel on the New Books Network, NBN. And this gives me an opportunity to speak to wonderful authors, editors, illustrators. And uh, Deborah, I had so much fun last time that you're, you're back. I'm back. And we, and we are celebrating a book which is out next month. But mm -hmm. the good news is you can pre-order it. Yes. And you're going to tell everybody the book and you're going to show it to them. And uh, we're going to quell. Great. Is that not quell? There's another word. It's a Yiddish word. Okay. It'll come to me. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not the right word. Okay. So you want me to talk about peculiar primates? Yes. Either talk okay. about peculiar primates or sing Beatles songs. <laughs> okay. So peculiar primates is um, a follow-up to my first book that came out in May of 2021 called Freaky Funky Fish. Um, fascinating facts about fascinating or fun facts about fascinating fish was the subtitle. And so um, I came up with a follow-up uh, called Peculiar Primates, Fun Facts About These Curious Creatures. So, um, you know, it like Freaky Funky Fish, it just kind of highlights funny, weird, fascinating, interesting things that primates do to, you know, go as they go about their day to survive in the worlds that they live in. And it's just, it was a really, really fun book to write. And so fortunate that Claire Powell, uh, illustrated this one too, and her illustrations just add so much magic to the book. I love them. These books are so invested in your time and in the time of the illustrator. So much research goes into them. Yes, yes. I see I that have you to. have you have a copy right behind you. I do. This is this is a prompt for you to yes to show it to everybody. And, yes. Uh, if you want to uh, show us a couple of pages uh, for sure. the people who are viewing, we won't um, mind a bit. Yes. So it starts out kind of like Freaky Funky Fish did, where it talks about the similar things that um, primates have. So all primates climb and breathe in air. They have big brains and hands and hair. But, and then it talks about how different primates are, because not all primates are the same. Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, Somebody else wants to interview you. So, tell them I got there first. <laughs> it'll ring like four times and then it'll be done. <laughs> it's a landline; it never rings anymore. I can't believe it's ringing. <laughs> I told you, some somebody important is watching the show. <laughs> um, and again, Claire has done such amazing work. I love her colors in this book. So this spread is some primates hunt when it gets dark. One looks for food by tapping bark. And then as the um, Freaky Funky Fish book, Claire came up with, in the fish book, it was funky and freaky ratings. These are pe peculi peculiarity readings <laughs> or um, peculiarity department ratings. So she made it look like, um, like an explorer's journal again. Um, and I will show you my favorite spread. <laughs> this is a mandrel that has a colored butt. So it reads, one's butt is splashed with colored streaks. Some primates store food in their cheeks. And I just think the colored butt is really fun. <laughs> so there's just a lot of fun facts. And then the back matter again, Do you want to give do you want to give away the ending, which is so brilliant? No, we gotta save the ending. <laughs> Till when? Till it comes out. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> shucks. 
But um, but but it has a page and a half of back matters. The text is really simple and rhyming again, like freaky funky fish. But then the back matter fills you in on why and how um, it's, it's, the primates do what they do and where they live. It's not only uh, the rhyme; it's also the meter. Yes. You, you have you have this special gift <laughs> for for meter, um, and you should have been a uh, musician uh, oh. because it's just it's just you know kind of lilts and lults and it's beautiful thank you, thank you. so so now we'll go back we'll do a quick um, deborah from the beginning because we've done that already and then uh, i'll ask you some more questions okay so deborah from the beginning including the middle name thing which i'm not sure we talked about okay so we're starting over yeah okay <laughs> so i'm um, do you want me to um, take away the phone? No. Okay. So, I'm sorry. What are we doing? <laughs> We're talking about your life, dear. Okay. Um, I I'll help you. I was born on a farm. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was born on a dairy farm. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, I have eight sisters. And... Um, we, it was a small dairy farm in Wisconsin and we milked the cows, baled the hay, picked the stones. Uh, you know, my parents never had hired hands. And so we did it all. Um, and, uh, so without, um, a son to carry on the name, um, when I got married, I decided to legally change my middle name to Kempf. So that was my maiden name so to bring on, just to carry on the name in some way, shape and form. And then when um, I got my first contract for a book, I definitely wanted um, Deborah Kempf Shoemaker to be on the cover so that all my covers will have that name. And um, <clears throat> and that's just one way we can carry on the Kempf name. I think that that's marvelous. And uh, you told me in our first interview that you were always reading, that you yes. actually taught, taught yourself to read when you were four. Yes, I did. Um, I just, I don't know, I, you know, I think some people just, it, it comes naturally and other people, it takes a while, but once everyone reads, who cares how you learn how to read? But, um, yeah, I was about four years old and my older sisters were in school and I was sitting on the couch and I picked up a book. Um, there was Jane and Sue and Tommy or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, and I just started reading it. And my mom was in the other room and she said, um, they called me Debbie. Debbie, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm reading. She's like, well, you don't know how to read. So I brought the book into her and I read her the book. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, you can read. So, um, and honestly, I, I read all the time. I mean, ask anyone who knows me, I, I'm always reading books. So, um, and I was really shy in grade school, really, really shy. And so- um, Did you have to walk five friend. miles to grade school? like the old stories about farm uh, families? What was that? Did you have to walk five miles to your no, school? No, we did. It was about a, oh, our driveway was probably about an eighth of a mile and we had to walk that. And sometimes in Wisconsin, it's really cold. <laughs> so no, we had a bus, so we didn't have to walk to school. Um, I, so I can't, I can't give that story, but my kids do hear the stories about all the chores we had that, you know, being in the suburbs, they don't have quite as many chores as we did growing up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, I wouldn't say it's a, you don't live on a farm. I mean, you live in North Virginia, which is perhaps. Right. The suburbs of DC. We do not live on a farm. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, I wouldn't say it's a dying breed, but um, it's a, it's something that you should be considering writing about. I, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if many kids could relate to farm life. And I don't know. I just, um, I just kind of write whatever pops in my head. I have written a story called Too Many Sisters that I'm still in the revision process. I go back to it every now and then. I really, really want to write this story. I, not, It's not autobiographical, except for the fact that I had eight sisters. But, um, you know, I like nonfiction because one of my weaknesses seems to be plot. So this is a fiction story, and I'm just not quite getting the plot yet. So I've um, revised it again. I've got... Um, got a critique group looking at it. I think I'll be sending it to my agent at some point this fall, get his take on it. Um, but nonfiction just comes 
easier. Nonfiction and concept comes easy, easier to me. I want to write more fiction picture books. I've tried and, um, you know, plot is definitely much more of a challenge for me than um, I think nonfiction books are. Still, you are a wonder woman, woman of this business. We talked about it in our last uh, get together. Uh, only one in several thousand writers gets a uh, publishing deal with a traditional house. And you've had at least three that I know of. Yes. Um, are there more? There are two more under contract. I sold two books last year. Um, they haven't been announced yet. You know, that whole waiting game, waiting for the illustrators and waiting for the announcement. But um, initially there was supposed to be one in fall of 2023 and then the other in fall of 2024. Considering it's fall of 2022, I have a feeling that 2023 book will probably become a 2024 book. But yes, two more under contract. So I'm very, very happy, <laughs> very excited. And, but you do realize that you're very talented. I work very hard and yes, I hope I have some talent that <laughs> I don't, I, I don't want to brag. <laughs> you're, you're, you're so nice, Deborah. I, I will brag for you. Um, and, uh, and you're not only very talented, but you're very generous. And um, last time we didn't talk about PB Pitch. So, um, before we talk about PB Pitch, though, okay. um, if I remember correctly, you told you said on the last show that you were rejected 166 times. Yes. And and that you worked for 10 years before uh, well, you started yeah, yeah. before you started to get traction. Yes. What what gave you the belief that eventually things will happen? Uh, well, there were many months and times where I didn't think it was going to happen, but I just, I, I just figured I loved doing it. So even if nothing was going to happen, it gave me a purpose. I just loved doing it. I, I quit several times, but I could never seem to quit. Um, and I just figured <clears throat> if I stopped, there was no way it was going to happen. So I might as well just keep trying and, um, you know, it, it was just a matter of not writing and rewriting the same story over and over again. Um, that story that got the first yes, um, and that story actually never sold, but my first yes from an agent um, was probably my, I think I, I have it in some blog post somewhere, my 11th picture book that I felt was good enough to actually submit. Um, and then that never even sold. It went to four or five acquisition meetings, but never sold. Um, and then it was the, you know, Freaky Funky Fish was the fourth or fifth book that my agent had submitted that actually got the contract. So, um, you know, I was way beyond the 160 number um, before I got the first yes from a publisher. So, um, but I just adopted my first few years, I kept rewriting the same two stories. And then I just realized that at some point, you need to shelve things and start new. So I figured if I kept trying and I kept taking classes and studying craft, um, really studying current picture books that, um, you know, if I kept trying, it might happen, but if I stopped, it would never happen. So that's fantastic. Where it and um, you're very, you're very hardworking. You told me you have four critique groups. Yes, <laughs> which is a little bit much sometimes, but, um, I value all of them. So I, I continue with it. Some of them are less active than others. So that's fantastic. Um, let's talk about now the giving side of Deborah. Um, you like to help other people, this I know. Um, and um, you have organized or co-organized a big thing called PB Pitch. What is that? So PB Pitch is a Twitter pitch party. Um, for just picture books. So I joined Twitter. So in 2015, I joined Twitter because I kept hearing about um, PitMad, which was a pitch party for all types of books. And um, joined Twitter specifically to do pitch parties, did one or two of them. And after one March PitMad um, in 2015, uh, in Facebook, I was in, it was probably Kidlit411 actually, because that's the best Kidlit Facebook group there is. Um, Agreed. 
Mandy Yates had posted, does anyone feel like the, you know, picture books are getting no love? They're like the forgotten stepchild, I think, or something like that, she said. And she's like, we should start one just for picture books, anyone in. And so PJ McElvain and I both said, I have no idea what we're doing, but sure, I'll help. <laughs> so, um, so three months later in June of 2015, we decided we picked a date. We just cold emailed a whole bunch of editors and agents, and um, we created a handle, uh, you know, a, I mean, a, a hashtag PB pitch, created a website, and we like opened it up. And it was, um, I think, June 15th or something like that. No, it was June something of um, 2020 or 2015. And we're like, we have no idea if any writers will pitch or if any ed editors and agents will stop by. But they did. It trended within a few hours. And um, so we decided to do it. We host it three times a year, every June, every February, every June, and every October. Um, and it's always been a Thursday. So um, it's usually mid to end of month. Sometimes, you know, again, we look at our schedules. And now it's just P PJ and I, we are the co-hosts. And um, we know that every single party has produced at least one or two success stories. Um, the Pitter, the Twitter pitch party has uh, gone through significant, I think that there are so many of them now. Um, how many, that, how many pitches do you get in a party? You know, everyone asks, it, I mean, it's it looks like thousands. It's definitely thousands. I don't know if it's tens of thousands um, or maybe just several thousand, but there are lots of pitches. And um, it used to be, it felt like agents and editors would heart, which is basically saying, hey, I'd love to see this story. Um, I think that they used to heart a lot more pitches. And I think that um, it's hard for the pitchers, the, the picture book writers who pitch, I think that agents and editors, um, just due to the industry and due to the number of pitch parties that there are, I think they're a lot more selective in their pitches than they are in their hearts than they used to be. So I know that that's deflating for a lot of um, writers and, you know. It, it, it gets you downhearted. It does. It does. And I just want to remind people that this is just one avenue. It is not the only avenue. I didn't get uh, my agent by a pitch party. I just. Yeah, well, okay. So this is it. We're going to segue now. Okay. Um, I'll, I just, before we do that, uh, yeah. to all the authors and the potential authors, we talk about this a lot. The chances are less than one in a thousand. So if there are 10,000 pitches uh, in, in your party, um, there may be 10 hearts that lead to something and, and, and one or two books come out. And that's splendid, but those are the odds. And the odds of finding an agent are one in a thousand. How did you find your agent, Deborah? Uh, just and, who, and who is your agent? Okay, well, I'm on my second agent because <laughs> that's what happens. But so my first agent who sold Freaky Funky Fish and Tell Someone, um, it was Natasha Morris and she was with Bookends Literary at the time. Uh, actually, so it, it it wasn't a direct result of a pitch party, but we did a pitch party, a PB pitch party in February of 2017. The years blend together. And she had been an editor and she was harding um, pitches. And um, uh, I finally e emailed her or I messaged her on Twitter and just said, can you share, because she was with a bigger house that wasn't open to submissions, can you share with people who you heart? Um, and then she basically said, yes, there's an announcement coming soon. And she was becoming an agent. And so then I just had some friends that had queried her, but I basically heard her name because of PB Pitch. And then I decided I had a story that um, seemed to fit her manuscript wish list at the time. And so I submitted a story to her in, I think, May. And then by July, we had uh, signed. Um, and then she, uh, two years later, had left the agency and our contracts were with the agency. And so I'm now with James McCowan of Bookends Literary. Okay, but hold on, Deborah. Did she know who you were? No, well, I mean, I guess she knew that I was the host of PB Pitch, but okay. So once that, so let's let's take a time out. Uh, the the odds of finding an agent beyond the slush pile grow if you are doing something in the in the field, if you are helping people, if you are if you have a something like you have. 
um, this, this shows the level of interest that I think that agents cotton to. Um, so I think that this was, the, the PB party, it, it helped you in a sense. Um, you know, you helped a lot of people and, and you were helped in return. So I, one, of the, one of the stories here, I think, is that um, giving is a great way in this, and perhaps in everything in life, to getting back. So Natasha didn't sell a story in the end? She didn't sell that specific story. But she um, sold Freaky Funky. She sold Freaky Funky Fish and then Freak, tells Freaky someone. Funky Fancy <laughs> fr Fricassy Fish. <laughs> I love that book, by the way. Everybody oh. run out and buy Deborah's books. <laughs> you, will, you. you will not you will not get a better bang for your PB buck. Thank you. It, it was it, so truly a fun book to write. And um, what magic. Um, like I said, Claire Powell and her illustrations. Um, so much fun. Such a fun. Okay, back, back, back to uh, Natasha and mm -hmm. uh, your new agent. Yes. So anyway, um, I guess it was, um, I think, summer of 2020. Um, Natasha left the agency. And um, so then I, um, now I'm with James McGowan with Bookends Literary. And, um, and he's sold a few books that haven't been announced yet, but <laughs> they will be hopefully soon. Um, James is right up there. He's, I love working with him. He's, a, he's I mean, you know, everybody would love working with James. Uh, and he has this um, a video, uh, video cast that he does. Mm -hmm. It's very popular. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, by, by giving and by being out there, um, he has a wonderful reputation. So you are super lucky. I'm very lucky. Very lucky. And so is so is he. Oh, James, you. you're lucky to have Deborah. <laughs> okay, so now we come to the um I have several questions. So okay. did you learn to rhyme or did this just come naturally to you like reading out of the blue? Um, you know, I, I think some people have a natural ear, and I I think I have a natural ear. I um Growing up, I just loved to rhyme. I mean, you know, I just, my very first publication was in my third grade newsletter about a snail who ate some nails. <laughs> snail well, who ate nails? Yeah, he, he ate some nails. Um, and he swallowed some screws and went on a cruise. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so that was my very first publication of a little poem in my third grade newsletter. It was the school newsletter, um, but as a third grader, that was my first publication. And, um, you know, I, yes, I would write rhyming stuff a lot. Um, I remember, you know, when I would go out, I remember one time I was out in the bar with my sister and I would kept doing odes to things and I would rhyme things. So rhyming has just always been something fun. Um, so, uh, Yes. So you could have done you could have done hip hop. Maybe. Maybe I'll try that someday. <laughs> I, I think I think you have a future. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So um let's now get back to the future, the future okay. of writing, the future of writers, of aspiring writers. Um you have very good advice for people who want to go into this uh, masochistic area of writing picture books? Yes. Um, it's tough. <laughs> you need thick skin. Um, the advice that I always give people, um, you know, lots of new writers will ask and um, several things. Um, find a critique group, uh, either an in-person critique group or online. Um, Kidlit 401, their website, I think, gives you an opportunity to find critique partners. Um, the SCBWI, their message boards, you can, uh, if you join SCBWI, you can post some stories on those message boards for critiques. Um, you can go to conferences and get professional critiques from um, published authors and sometimes agents and editors. So keeping the story close to you <laughs> and having no one else give you feedback is not going to probably find you success. Um, there are very few people who... Um, can write without getting feedback and sell a story. So um, critique groups are probably the most important thing. 
be willing to put your story out there and then be willing to listen to the critique. And you don't have to change everything that they say, but if several people say something similar, then it's definitely, uh, my, my first reaction is always, oh no, they don't understand. That's always my gut reaction and I know that. So then I give it a day or two and then I'm like, oh, I think they're wrong, but I'll give it a shot. You know, you're on a computer, you don't ever lose your stories. So, um, and many, many times their thought processes, you know, they're like, oh, there was something to what they were saying. And sometimes I don't agree with it. And then I go back to what I originally had, but um, it never hurts to listen and try and play with the manuscript. Uh, the other advice I love to give is um, find some recent, picture books, not something that you read when you were young, not something that you read to your kids if they're older than seven or eight <laughs> um, or nine or 10 or teens like mine are. Um, find um, picture books that you love now and that um, that are doing well, or maybe they're not doing well, but you just love them. Find picture books that you love and then type up the text and type up the page spread numbers so that you can... Um, it, it helps you kind of develop develop a pacing, an innate pacing, and it takes the words away from the pictures because the pictures are done after the text is sold, if you are an author only. And this is advice for author only. So I'm illustrators, you know, I, I won't give advice because I'm not one. But if you are an author only, um, it's nice to see the, just the words on a piece of paper, the black and white of it, um, because that's what's sold to the editor. Um, so you can see how much room they leave for the illustrator. Um, and just typing up, I mean, I have hundreds of books. I've been typing up books since I think 2011, probably, where, when I read that advice somewhere. And um, I think it definitely helps when I'm writing new drafts now, my drafts are more polished because I have an innate sense of pacing and stuff like that because I type up books. And then plus, I can't afford to buy every single book that's out there. <laughs> so um, I can use them as mentor text. If I'm writing a fiction story and I want to see, you know, in the vein of a book that I've recently read, I can pull up the text to see, okay, well, how did they kind of build the scene and how did they create the page turn? Um, so I have that all without having to, I mean, I have a bookshelf full of books, but I can't afford to buy every book that I love because... But, and then there's the library. I mean, I literally check out probably 15 books a week. Um, I don't type them all up, but usually there's one or two that I'm like, this is worthy of being typed up. <laughs> so um, that that is my advice. And, uh, and never to give up. And never to give up. Nope. I mean, because if you give up, it won't happen. And if you keep trying and giving you can give up on a manuscript that you love um after a while if it's not going to sell and who knows maybe and in fact um some manuscripts were put in the drawer for a while and then um i brought them out and did some revisions and then um, some of them have sold so um sometimes you just need to take a break from what you're writing and start something new you told me once that you have hundreds of ideas for books yes so I, yeah, um, yeah, no, it was called Pebo Idmo at the time, Tara Lazar's, um, now it's called Story Storm because she's, um, it's no longer just for picture book. It was picture book idea month, which everyone pronounced differently, but I called it Pebo Idmo. <laughs> um, that was where I, um, yes, so it used to be every November, now it's every January, and now it's called Story Storm, but I highly recommend that, um, but I have a an app on my phone in Evernote and on my MacBook that I, um, if I have an idea, I just jot it down and I, I create a new list every year. Um, and then when I'm stuck in writing or not enjoying a story that I'm working on and I wanna write something new, I go back to those lists. And I mean, some of them make no sense whatsoever. I mean, some of these lists, I mean, I've started that in probably 2014 or 15. I'm like, I have no idea what I meant by that, but um, <laughs> yes. But, you know, I have, I, I'll have to live to be 200 if I want to write everything I want to write. <laughs> okay, so um, remind me to talk about, tell someone before we uh, sign off. Okay. Because we, ha we haven't talked about it. And that's your de debut book, is it not? No, Freaky Funky Fish was my debut. And then Tell ah. Someone about in October. Okay, so, so we're going to tell someone about Tell Someone in a minute. Okay. Um, let's tell them now before we forget. 
So you also have, ah, no, let's, let's go to fiction and nonfiction for a moment. Okay. So I, I'm interviewing lots of wonderful, gracious people like you uh, who, don't, uh, who, who um, don't write that much fiction. Okay. And they all have an excuse. And, and you have an excuse. But after, the, after this interview, um, I want you to come on. We'll have another few minutes tete a tete to, to talk about this, to see whether it's an excuse. Because I'm guessing, Deborah, that some of your ideas are fiction ideas. Oh, absolutely. It's not, like, not like hundreds of ideas, uh, leaping lizards and the familiar frogs and the, <laughs> and the behemoth buildings and so on. <laughs> so so um, jump back after the uh, interview on the same link and we'll have a little tete a tete. Um, okay. And now let's talk about your, this is a remarkable book, uh, Telling Someone. Yes. Um, we never talked about that one. Okay. Um, here we go. And you can also show people Freaky Funking Fish. Freaky Funking, let's, fascinating. Let's <laughs> Freaky Funky Fish. <laughs> okay, so tell someone, um, this is with Albert Whitman. Um, and this book actually came from a very different way. Um, so with my agent, Natasha, um, and Albert Whitman had actually approached her um, saying that they wanted a book about open communication um, for the trade market, um, that um, they, they envisioned the title tell someone they were open to, you know, a different title, but did Natasha have any clients who um, would be interested in writing a book? And it would have to go through the regular acquisitions process. It was no guarantee, but um, so she approached me. And um, as I said, my initial reaction was um, no, <laughs> because it scared me. Um, I literally said that to her, well, I said, can I have a few um, days to think about this? And she's like, well, of course. And then as soon as I got off the phone, I remembered a, um, a CBWI conference that I was at, Kwame Alexander, who's a phenomenal person, phenomenal writer. He did um, a session um, at a conference that's saying, you always say yes, and then you figure it out. So I remembered that. And so I emailed Natasha right away. I said, of course, I'm going to say yes, but it, you know, it scared me. But the reason she had suggested me is I had written a different story about um, a hard emotion. And so even though that wasn't, I, I felt like wasn't my natural, she's like, you have it in you to do it. So anyway, so that's where we came up with Tell Someone. And Albert Whitman had said they want it to be about not just hard things, um, about pleasant things too, but obviously to touch on the idea that if things aren't good, if people are not being good, um, you know, you need to tell someone. So that's kind it, it, of what the crux of this Deborah, book. Deborah, this is a brave book. Yep. It touches on uh, child molestation. It mm -hmm. touches on death. Wow. Yeah. So. Um, you didn't pull the punches. I mean, the book is is gentle and kind, but you really you covered the bases. Yes. And why I love this book is because I think you and I were raised in the generation where children should be seen but not heard. And I don't think that's the right message we should be giving kids. <laughs> so I do like that there's a lot of socially emotional learning books out there like this that are, you know, encouraging kids to speak up. Um, and, and I do like that Albert Whitman really wanted the book to have some positive stuff in it too. So it is a book that goes, you know, kind of back and forth between um, happy moments and then the harder moments. And then it gets, you know, harder as it goes on. So. Yes, it, it, it's, it's a great concept book uh, and it's not fiction. Right, so I so love- We're gonna talk about fiction later. <laughs> yeah, you love fiction and and- concept books. I do nonfiction and concept mostly. <laughs> so I've written a lot of fiction books, but there's always something missing about that. So who says? Um, well, they're not being sold. So <laughs> someone is saying it. <laughs> so you're writing fiction and you are submitting it. Yes. Um, well, my fiction tends to be more concepty. <laughs> So I, I've written some stories that, that are true fiction with just a plot. And, you know, my agents have felt like they weren't quite ready to go out there in the world. So um, I love when you say true fiction. Well, <laughs> you know, yes. Because <laughs> um, I, I mean, tell someone is fiction, but it's concept. So, I mean, 
and the library would be classified under a fiction book, but um, it's a concept book. And um, yes, so um, you, you said something about Freaky Funky Fish. I'll actually- Yes, of course. Yeah. So the fun thing about Freaky Funky Fish is this is, this is, came out in May of 2021. And then a month later, it came out in Australian. <laughs> and so they changed the cover <laughs> color. And, you know, a couple of words are spelled differently because it's Australian. Yeah, but because, so, because, and water is different colored in Australian. Right. <laughs> so that was fun. And then just last week, it came out in German. <laughs> wow. Ausgefeppende <laughs> Fische. Don't ask me. <laughs> um, but it's not, a, it's not alliteration. Ah, it is. I was gonna flip the fish. It's right. it's ger it's Deutsche alliteration. Right. I guess I, you're you're al you're allowed to have the alliteration letter in the middle of the word. Yeah. So and but it appears that they. I mean, I don't read German, but it appears that they made it rhyme. That's fantastic. Yeah. So they, the words look similar anyway. They, 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 their endings look similar. So yeah, that that's just a miracle. Yeah, so that was really fun. So I have like wow. this whole little like international collection of freaky funky fish. And Peculiar Primates also sold to the German publisher as well. So I don't know when that's going to come out, but I mean, it's a lot to do a translation. So it'll probably be about a year and a half to two years is my assumption. I've done translations and they're when they're in rhyme, they are difficult. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's say, uh, let's end this. Okay. By asking you uh, what your goals are for the next couple of years. Um, to sell more picture books. I would love to have at least one or two come out every year. So we're out on submission with two different ones right now. Not getting much traction, but, you know, hopefully. Um, and then I'm, you know, I've got another nonfiction one that um, I'm about ready to send to my agent. I've got another idea that I'm excited to work on this fall. And I've got a fiction one, Too Many Sisters, that I've told myself I will at least send it to James this fall and see what he thinks of it. <laughs> That's phenomenal. So, Deborah, we're going to say goodbye to our listeners and the viewers. Okay. And um, Deborah Kemp Schumacher. Shoemaker. Shoemaker. Uh, a ter a shoemaker, yes. A, a terrific writer and a wonderful person. And we have yet to meet, but we will meet again, I hope, next year when your next book comes out. Um, you're not going to tell me what it is now, but um, it's about some kind of animals? No. So the next one coming out is actually, it's another social emotional learning book. Um, ah, okay. It's been announced? No. Well, you can, you can just tell me now quietly. <laughs> no, I know you won't. No. So and then the, the other one is um, a nonfiction concept book, I guess, too. So Wonderful. So this has been great. Uh, and I'm Mel Rosenberg, the host of NBM, the Children's Literature Channel. I want to thank Deborah Kempf Shoemaker. Uh, and uh, it's been another great interview. And we're going to say goodbye to everybody. We're going to leave and then come right back on to the same link and have a little tete-a-tete -tete -tete about writing fiction. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Deborah, Bye. thanks. Bye. This was so much fun. Thank you, Mel. Absolutely. See you in a minute. Okay. See everybody else in one week. <laughs>